issues tonight. As a teacher at Redwood and Drake gets to drive back and forth quite a bit on Sir Francis Drake, I have vested interest in one of the issues that we'll be talking tonight, but I promise we'll be touching on a wide variety of topics this evening. I just want to give a quick thanks to the team at Sir Francis Drake High School for hosting tonight, including our Drake sophomore student volunteers who did all the technical stuff with these lights and such. Uh, if you please give a hand to our super sophomores, Cyrus Thielen and Lucy Barnett. Please give them a hand. There they are. Two more years, two more years. Uh, we like sophomores on this. Um, also, in the audience is our amazing volunteer board for the San Anselmo Chamber of Commerce, who is putting this on, and our president, Connie Rogers. If all of you could stand there as they're busy timing and getting ready, and Paul Rogers, that includes you for getting the water cups, too. Like, stand up, please, and bow to the crowd. And Connie's out there, too. So. Thank you, San Anselmo Chamber of Commerce. Finally, I, I applaud all of you for being part of Democracy in Action. Thank you for being here tonight at Drake and finding the little theater. I know it's tricky. Just so you know, there are restrooms on the other side of this wall, so just heads up to that. With that, we'll jump right into things. I am honored to introduce our moderator this evening, Mr. Robert Sterling from the Marin Independent Journal. Mr. Sterling has been a newspaper reporter and editor for more than 36 years and has worked for five community newspapers over that time. He served as city editor of the Marin Independent Journal for 13 years before becoming editor three years ago. He is married, has three grown children, three grown children, and lives in Terra Linda, and we're lucky to have him here tonight. Mr. You? Sterling, come on up. And my name is Greg Davison. I'm chair of the board for the San Anselmo Chamber of Commerce. So it's great to be here, and I teach at Drake and Redwood. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Everyone hear me okay? So, and thank you to the San Anselmo Chamber, uh, especially Tony Rogers and Greg for organizing this event. These types of forums are so important for our democracy and I truly appreciate the Chamber's involvement and I appreciate it on behalf of the Marin IJ as well. It's good for all of us. And thank you to our three candidates here tonight. One thing's for sure, we have three excellent individuals with a load of experience in local government and service to the public. I think voters in the second district, which as you all know encompasses the heart of Marin, San Anselmo and Fairfax, Kentfield, Ross, Larkspur and Greenbrae, should consider themselves lucky to have strong choices among the people seeking to represent them at the Civic Center. So before we get going, some ground rules. Each candidate will start with a two minute introduction. We'll go in alphabetical order and then reverse that at the end of the session for two minute summations. We have timers on hand here in the front row with cards. They'll flag the candidates to let them know how much time they have. And when the time's up, I think they'll just wave their arms wildly and get their attention. Um, when it comes to questions, each candidate will have a, a one and a half minutes to answer each question. I'll begin with a different candidate for each question, then probably reverse the sequence partway through the session and maybe reverse a third time Keep, I'll keep trying to mix it up. Um, we'll start with uh, a number of questions that have been submitted by members of the San Anselmo Chamber. And we'll open it up either at the end or, or, or even during that sequence of questions to questions from the audience. So you can submit cards. Uh, raise your hand and there'll be volunteers who will grab them from you. Submit cards with your questions. They'll run them up to Gray who will review the questions and will pass them on to me. Um, Greg mentions there's restrooms over this side of the room. I think there's water in the back, so feel free to be comfortable. And with that, I will introduce our candidates tonight. Frank Egger served on the Fairfax Town Council for 40 years, which has to be some kind of record. This is not his first bid for county supervisor. In fact, Mr. Egger ran for supervisor back in 1976, but ultimately he lost to someone by the name of Barbara Boxer. He has also sought elected posts in Marin, ranging from county assessor to water district director. He owns a boutique winery, worked as a truck driver at Kilpatrick's Bakery for 44 years. Kevin Haroff won election to the Larkspur City Council in 2013 after serving on the City Planning Commission. He's been a Marin resident since 1986. He worked as legal counsel for Exxon 
for five years before specializing in environmental law. He lives in Greenbury now and is the managing partner of Martin Law's San Francisco office. And Katie Rice, the incumbent supervisor, was appointed by Governor Jerry Brown in 2011 to replace the late Hal Brown, whom she served as an aide for nearly a decade. She was subsequently elected to her first full term in office in 2012. Ms. Rice, who grew up in Mill Valley and now lives in Sleepy Hollow, founded, yes, the Ross Valley School District's fundraising arm. Okay, we'll begin with our two-minute introductions. First, Mr. Egger. Well, it works. <clears throat> Welcome to Drake High, home of the Pirates. Thank you for coming. My daughter, Rory, was a cheerleader here at Drake and I believe the second district needs a new cheerleader at the Civic Center. I have been very fortunate in my life, able to do meaningful public policy work for 50 years. I've always advocated for the health of our environment and our communities. I believe the two go hand in hand. And I'm someone who is willing to take the initiative, both figuratively and literally. I'm the only candidate before you that has taken on Monsanto I was one of five original sponsors of a ballot initiative to protect Marin from genetically modified organisms in our food supply. It was called Measure B, GMO Free Marin, and it started right here in the second district. The voters of Marin agreed with us in a landslide vote. And I'm the only candidate before you with a spotless voting record. Zero pesticide use. For the last eight years, I've fought alongside other community leaders to protect Marin from aerial pesticide spraying. Over the years, I've been paying very close attention to issues flood management here. Years ago, I helped preserve the upper Ross Valley Creeks from being paved over with concrete by the Corps of Engineers. More recently, I've been working with local residents to save Memorial Park and left Gomez Field. I walk the streets of the 2nd District and talk to folks. Our residents have great institutional knowledge of flood events and patterns, and many good ideas on what could be done to help the situation. A major shift in direction from the consultant-based status quo would benefit everyone. I think we could do better. I ask for your vote. Thank you very much. Mr. Harrow. Uh, thanks, Bob, and welcome uh, everyone to tonight's uh, uh, debate, supervisor debate forum, I guess that's what we're calling it. I want to thank very much the San Anselmo Chamber of Commerce for hosting tonight's event and for all of you for coming out here this evening. I really appreciate it, and I know that sentiment is shared by my opponents here on the dais this evening. I share the concerns that many in our community have over the pressure to accommodate regional growth and development in Marin County. Too often, the response to these pressures has been the promotion of increasing levels of urbanization throughout the county. This has meant traffic congestion that keeps getting worse, threats to our local water supply, and continuing assaults to Marin's visual and natural environment. As your next supervisor for District 2, I will take on each of these challenges, and I will do it in a way that is open, transparent, and fiscally responsible. My dedication to the environment is long-standing and strong, something the Sierra Club specifically acknowledged with their endorsement of my campaign this year. I am committed to principles of transparency and open government. Those are principles I live by as a member of the Larkspur City Council. I am committed to resisting proposals to add more high-density development to green spaces along the 101 corridor. I am committed to enhancing environmental protections for our parks and open spaces, including a ban on the use of glyphosate-based herbicides on public lands. I am committed to dealing with our pension issues in ways that are both fiscally responsible and respectful towards the needs of our public employees. And I am committed to running my campaign in an honest and respectful way, focusing on issues, not personalities, and not the past. The challenges we face in Marin are complicated and beyond anything we have seen before. We need a new voice with the credentials and experience to confront those challenges thoughtfully and decisively. I am prepared to be that new voice, and I ask you to support me in that effort. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rice? Good evening. Um, it is great to be here tonight, and my thanks to the Chamber and to Drake High as well, and to uh, Mr. Sterling for moderating. 
So it, it's really been an honor to serve the residents of District 2 and San Anselmo um, these last five years as supervisor. And as I said, it's really wonderful to be here tonight at Drake High. My work, my work as supervisor is informed by two decades of community service and community work here in the Ross Valley, supporting schools, advocating for equity in education, working on local causes and campaigns that make our community stronger. I grew up in Marin and I raised my three children here and they all went to Drake. I know what makes this county and this community so special. Our values around open space protection, children and family and healthy, vibrant communities goes back decades and distinguishes us and our community. As supervisor, I focus my attention on press pressing issues, including combating tra local traffic and congestion with the initiation of the Ross Valley school bus pilot through the Sir Francis Drake Corridor Improvement Project and by supporting many efforts to reduce car trips generally and encourage alternative modes of transit. In my first term, I've had successes in environmental protection and in the areas of public safety and public health. I've worked with neighbors and conservation groups to acquire and permanently protect the beautiful Sky Ranch property. Under my leadership, the county designated its parks, its recreation facilities, and public buildings as pesticide-free. And I've worked to secure millions in funding to advance flood prevention, flood prevention efforts and improve our ability to detect and fight wildland fire. On the public health front, I, I championed sensible vaccine policies and a county-wide drug take-back ordinance as part of this county's battle against the opioid crisis. My leadership style is hands-on, collaborative, and inclusive. And as I said, a pleasure to be here tonight, and I look forward to the rest of the evening. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Rice. So, we'll begin, we'll launch into the questions. We'll start with, with Mr. Ager. And and continue in alphabetical order, reversing it at a certain point. And so here's the first question, and it's a biggie. The Ross Valley has been plagued with flooding for many years. What do you see as the best path forward to reducing the risk of flooding in the valley? It's tough when, when our communities developed in a floodplain, but there are ways to reduce flood impacts. There are green solutions. We do not need to dig up our children's playgrounds and ball fields to create detention bases. That's a consultant driven program. It's big money. There are great alternatives. Cleaning the creeks, raising some structures, maybe even moving some structures. Cisterns, we have to create some cisterns and capture some rainwater for use in summer dry months for irrigation. We've got to replace the, the uh, imitation sod uh, at the ball fields, the, uh, the turf, with real sod. That way, it'll be safer for our kids and it, it will absorb water. It will reduce the runoff that's, that's flooding areas like Ash, ash, uh, way right over here, little creek. Uh, I'm sorry, the little, the little street. And um, uh, we we need to listen to the folks in our community who know who know why it floods and, and know have better solutions than, than the consultants who are just out of touch and, and have no institutional knowledge. Thank you, Mr. Haroff. Thanks for that. Oops. Thanks for that question. It is a it is a big question and an important one. Um, I've been engaged on flood control issues now for the better part of a year um, and have watched what uh, our local officials have attempted to accomplish. And I think it's actually very disappointing to me personally to see the amount of effort that has gone to accomplish virtually nothing and actually to go forward with proposals that are not transparent, that effectively utilize public processes to mask uh, the failure to actually develop comprehensive flood control strategies. I think it's important that we steer away from the current approach uh, that the county and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has emphasized, focusing on expensive and highly engineered solutions like detention basins uh, and what we're now seeing being proposed for Unit 4 in Ross. Um, it may, may, may or may not be a role for detention basins, uh, but not at public parks like Memorial Park and Lefty Gomez where money is diverted for recreational purposes and not for flood control purposes. 
Um, I attended the meeting last night uh, on Unit 4, and again, it's perpetuated by a need to maintain access to grants. It's not focused on actually preserving the integrity of our creek system and managing flood issues going forward to the future. We need to focus on realistic solutions that will get the water through the system, out of the system, and into the bay. And I think there are opportunities to do that without a, human, a, a tremendous expenditure of totally engineered solutions that don't accomplish much. Thank you. Ms. Rice? Yeah, obviously, uh, flood, flooding, flood prevention, um, reducing flood risk is, um, I think, one of the single biggest issues for the Ross Valley and obviously something I've worked on um, in my time as supervisor and before. And um, the, the thing that keeps me going in, in terms of working on this issue, even as we have to do course corrects and, and make changes with regards to the program, is a memory of walking down Kent Avenue the day after uh, the flood and seeing the damage that was done way down there in, in Kentfield on Kent Avenue along with downtown San Anselmo and Morningside. Um, it was an enormous mess here. Anybody who was here and, and saw the devastation um, uh, can attest to that. So um, it's a big problem and it's not easily solved and it's going to take multiple um, solutions including increasing creek capacity, including removing constriction points uh, or fi uh, or fixing them like the bridge replacements in San Anselmo and including um, detention at some point. But um, I think it's important that we also learn as we go along that there's no, and this was the lesson of Memorial Park, you can't move forward with a project unless you have community support and you can't get community support for a project unless you really have excellent community process. So going forward that's my commitment and in the meantime we have we have, we're on the cusp of actually getting some stuff done. These bridge, four bridge replacements, the Army Corps project in Ross is getting going and we'll go through a community process there and again, increasing creek capacity. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Second question, and we'll begin with Mr. Haroff. How best can the county and the town work together to best serve the citizens of the Ross Valley? By town, I'm assuming all the towns. Well, there's a lot to be done. Uh, one of the things that, or there are several things that kind of drove me into this run for supervisor. One was a concern over the tendency, particularly derived from the county, to promote uh, the proliferation of high density development throughout the county, not only within unincorporated lands and rent, but also in the municipalities. So that's actually a place where we can work together uh, much, much better. Uh, we have seen municipalities go forward with projects like the Wind Cup project in Court Madeira uh, on their own, which will only increase and exacerbate the traffic congestion conditions that we already have in Marin. Um, there's a failure to coordinate on housing and on density development within Marin County. The county needs to do a better job in the development of its housing elements. The county needs to do a better job in terms of its engagement with regional agencies uh, to resist the impulse to uh, benefit economic interests outside of Marin and focus on solutions that are more appropriate to the natural uh, and community character of Marin County, not regional interests uh, like ABAG and MTC. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rice? And one of the things that um, I really believe strongly in in terms of local government and, and generally community work across the board is um, collaboration. And um, though historically and institutionally there's tension between county government and, and local municipalities, um, I've, uh, right from the get-go, um, tried to break down those barriers. One of the things I bring to this job are, are hundreds and hundreds of relationships with electeds, with leaders, with community leaders, with residents throughout the Ross Valley. They're strong relationships, they're positive relationships, and the folks in this community know that I'm there to call on, know that I will work with them, and there's no hierarchy. So I really believe actually that partnering, partnering around local issues where I can be of support to a local municipality in any way I can is truly important. And then I also believe that with those positive relationships, when we have a unified voice between jurisdictions and or between the county and the local jurisdiction, we're much more likely to make progress. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, next question, and we'll begin with Ms. Rice? Right. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay, no problem. 
getting ahead of myself. We have 11 incorporated cities and towns with 11 mayors and 44 council members. They're all independent. They functioned as a unit. They have a group called the mayors and council members and they work together to try to solve issues. I know Fairfax and San Anselmo, uh, have, we have a resolution between the two towns. And the resolution says is e if either town, either Fairfax or San Anselmo, has a development application before them that may adversely impact each the other, the towns will have the opportunity to respond and take a look at what those applications are. It's too bad Larkspur and Corte Madera didn't have that same kind of an agreement. But the county should not be forcing high density housing in the planning sphere of influence of, the, of our towns. For instance, the 7-Eleven out, out here in Fairfax was designated by the county for 30 units per acre. They said there'd only be 10 units built there, but it was rezoned for 30 units per acre, and, and so that's really unacceptable. Now the, 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 towny, the county and the towns can work together, need to work together, but the county should not be overriding what's happening in our communities, and, and those decisions belong with the 11 mayors and, and 11 city and town councils. Great, thank you. Now the next question, beginning with Ms. Bryson. It's a long question, I'll try to boil it down, but it's about traffic, specifically it's about traffic on Drake, which continues to be a challenge. Yet, with the dollars and pending upgrades, instead of moving cars and commerce, it seems like some people, it seems like some special interests are coming in to slow down traffic even more. This questioner thinks that there are bike lobbyists and, and, and others who want narrow lanes and more sidewalks or fewer sidewalks, smart lights or no smart lights, and yet backup issues are coming, continuing on Richmond Bridge, and uh, East, East Bay commuters are, uh, those issues aren't being addressed uh, on the bridge. So bottom line is, what is your plan to allocate dollars for the Sir Francis Drake Traffic Improvement Project? So the Sir Francis Drake uh, Improvement Project is for that section of Drake down through Kentfield and Green Ray beginning at the Ross Town border and there is funding already allocated for that project. It won't cover, it's half of it goes towards repaving and the other half has been what we've gone through a community process with on figuring out how can we make that roadway work more efficiently with the primary user frankly on that roadway being automobiles. How do we move traffic and transit through that corridor more quickly and efficiently. And we've come up with some great ideas with the community that um, among intersection improvements, signal light timing improvements, and then at the same time we're looking at where are there gaps in the pedestrian sidewalks and places where we need, we need to make some safety upgrades. There are no bike lanes, and uh, b uh, bike lanes were taken off the table right from the get-go on that project because that is not a safe roadway for bikes, and there's a parallel multi-use path that can be used. And I would say, after Sir Francis Drake, we need to actually, and, and this is what I'm working on getting money for, is improvements on East Sir Francis Drake and improvements at the Bellum 580 uh, connection, 101 and, and uh, 580 up in San Rafael, so that we can get cars to that third lane on the Richmond San Rafael Bridge when it opens up. So there's designs that have been made for both those improvements. I'm going after money right now, and the goal is to get those improvements made on East Sir Francis Drake and at Bellum and 580 when, uh, next year so that when the third lane opens up, we've actually got some relief, traffic relief in that quarter. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hager? There's an old saying in this business, when, when you find yourself in a hole, quit digging. Had I been supervisor this year, I would not have voted to approve an amendment to the original local coastal plan that allows an additional one and a half million square feet of new residential and commercial development in West Marin. Sir Francis Drake is the direct access route to West Marin. The excessive new development will, that will be allowed will adversely impact traffic throughout the Ross Valley. On the lower end of the Ross Valley, we need, we need two lanes, southbound on one to one, we need two lanes northbound and, and eastbound from Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. We should not be narrowing the lanes uh, to 11 feet. The Marin General Hospital is a trauma center. It has access. There's emergency equipment rolling in and out all the time, and, and they need decent sized lanes to be able to move that equipment in and out. As far as, as, as the 580 uh, route and Richmond Santa Fe Bridge, we need to change how we collect tolls. We need to split 
split the Golden Gate Bridge. So you pay in the morning, and with electronic tolls, this is very easy to do. And then you pay northbound at night. And then eastbound on the Richmond Santa Fe Bridge, you pay again to cross that bridge. That would put that traffic that belongs on our Bay Bridge back on the Bay Bridge. Folks are coming this way, coming up across the Golden Gate, up 101, and over at Richmond Santa Fe because they beat the traffic in the East Bay. In addition, we need three lanes going in each direction. The bike lane should not be taken up on the top. It's, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it should be a, a, a bridge for vehicles. Thank you. Thank you. Time's up. Mr. Haroff? Sure. I, I understand your question to focus on Sir Francis Drake, in particular on the rehabilitation yes. project, not on regional transportation projects and, and challenges. So I hope we'll get into some of those issues maybe later on because we need to focus on Sir Francis Drake. Um, Katie correctly defined the geographic scope of the problem. It's between Ross and Highway 101. There were $13 million that were originally allocated for the Sir Francis Drake Rehabilitation Project. Then mysteriously, as the project went forward, there was a decision made that we really only need about $6.5 million to do road rehabilitation project, freeing up another $6.5 million for a wide range of potential projects that really have nothing to do whatsoever with traffic congestion. I have to take issue with Katie and the suggestion that we're taking out bike lanes. We're actually preserving the plans that the county is perpetuating now. They're just being reconfigured and being called something else. But the overall structure of the way in which the county is proposing to deal with traffic congestion hasn't changed. We need to rehabilitate the roads. We need to have three lanes going from west to east. Uh, we need to utilize that six and a half million dollars that has been freed up to focus on minimization of traffic congestion and my personal view is that we need to uh, uh, allow the development of adaptive traffic signal control technology to improve the course of the flow that goes through uh, that corridor and onto Highway 101. We ought not to be spending money on any project in part of the rehabilitation project that has anything to do with anything other than traffic congestion. Thank you. This next question digs a little deeper, so to speak, into the flood issue, and it actually is a series of questions and I'll let you figure out how to address them but we'll start with Mr. Egger and I'll just read the questions I've got here and you can answer as you wish. Do you oppose the use of Lefty Gomez Field as a flood detention basin? How much water can be held back with, with detention basins? How much is the purchase of the Perry's Field? I, I think that's the sun, old Sunnyside Nursery growing ground. How much does the purchase of that field add to the cost for flood mitigation? And are the Perry's on board to sell their property as a detention basin? So take it away, Mr. Abraham. Lefty Gomez Field, that's an easy one. I flat out oppose the use of Lefty Gomez Field for detention basin. I have all along. How much water could be held back? Well, I, I believe that the that the estimates put forth by the engineers, by the consultants, uh, underestimates uh, just what's going on here in the Ross Valley and where the water's coming from. And um, that detention basin isn't going to, at Lefty Gomez Field, would not at all uh, affect much of a, of a reduction in flooding. Now, the Perrys, the Perrys were at a meeting uh, in San Anselmo last week. And they flat out said no one's contacted them. They said the county keeps talking about buying their property. They see it in newsletters, read it in newspaper, but no one's contacted them. Uh, it's kind of interesting that uh, uh, the county supposedly working with the Perrys, but no one's contacted them. You know, I believe any successful flood mitigation or, or meaningful flood relief assistance program would require a major shift in direction from the status quo. I would begin, by sh begin that shift by seeking and applying localized institutional knowledge of flooding. And instead of simply regurgitating the recommendations of multi-million dollar consultants for self-justifying projects such as detention bases, I would take steps to implement green infrastructure and other common sense approaches quickly. And we'd save taxpayer money in the process. Residents here know a lot and they have a strong sense of what needs to happen. We, may, we need to pay much more closer attention to what they're saying. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Haroff? Okay, again, I think your question was focused on really two issues. One is the viability of Lefty Gomez, and the second is the viability of Sunnyside Nursery property. Um, I actually agree with Frank. I do not believe that the county has demonstrated that Lefty Gomez 
will achieve a level of flood control protection um, that they've in fact suggested that it might. And at the same time, it will require, again, a highly engineered solution that will be very expensive, that will include monies that are diverted primarily for recreational purposes, and will actually result in a playing field that's no longer suitable for kids. Sunnyside Park is a different map. Uh, I am not in principle uh, against the use of detention facilities where those facilities can be demonstrated to actually retain floodwaters and keep floods from moving down through the system. Sunnyside Park creates a potential opportunity for us to do that. And in fact, it is potentially a very desirable one because it will allow us to convert that property into something that actually does use green space in a much better way. I think I have 30 seconds still left. The, the uh, I think so, um, yeah. Uh, there is an issue about how much it will cost. And uh, you're right, the Perrys were at the meeting the other day. I was at that meeting as well. Um, and they were expressing a lot of dis dismay over the fact that they weren't being treated fairly in terms of engaging on the process of cost. So I don't actually know how much it's gonna cost to do Sunnyside Park. I would like to know. I think the Perrys would like to know, and I think the community would like to know. And I'm in favor of a process that will allow us to get there. Thank you. Ms. Rice? Yeah, I'm gonna start with the third question, uh, the Sunnyside question. Um, and, and yes, the one Perry of three Perrys was at the meeting last week. And um, so the Sunnyside, Sunnyside Nursery site actually holds a lot of potential. And the county did, uh, the Board of Supervisors gave permission to our real estate negotiator two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, to actually begin negotiations. And he's having to negotiate with three different parties, uh, Ross, three different Perrys who um, are party to that property. Sunnyside is really attractive and a more attractive uh, detention site, frankly, than um, Lefty Gomez because it will probably end up being less expensive even with the purchase of property because of the need, uh, uh, we won't need to replace the uh, fields and the structures and all the recreation um, uh, elements, um, though we could turn it into a passive park. So I'm really, I think Sunnyside's a, a possibility and I think we should explore it and I think it's something that the community might be willing to explore as well as an alternative to Lefty and they're both important with regards to detention. We can do a lot with regards to flood control by removing constriction points and creating more capacity in the creek, creek and doing the kind of green infrastructure improvements that um, Frank has been talking about, but we don't get near to where we need to get uh, with regards to actually take, um, keeping, keeping the water off of our streets at, at um, any significant level. So we do need detention. I hope that the community will be open to it if we have an opportunity at Sunnyside and onward. Thank you. Okay, we have actually one more question on flooding, and I think it's born of the frustration that some people feel that nothing's getting done. So the question is, we'll begin with Mr. Haroff, what is the real timeline to do something about actual flood mitigation? I really wish I knew the answer to that question. Um, we've been working on flood control now with money available to actually get something done for 10 years and actually nothing much has happened. Um, we had a meeting, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, about Unit 4 in the Ross, uh, in Corbidera Creek in, in the town of Ross. Um, that project has been percolating along for a long period of time. There's actually a timeline for implementing that project, at least according to the Corps of Engineers. The problem is we haven't been told what the project is. Uh, there was a meeting earlier in the winter, in January, uh, where the Corps and the county got up and made a presentation about their plans for doing flood control uh, in, uh, in Corp Madera Creek in that area in Ross. Uh, but they, although they initiated an environmental review process through the issuance of a notice of intent to prepare environmental impact reports, they didn't define what the project is. And it was actually only until the meeting that we had last night where they first started to outline what that project might look like. And it's a very elaborate system of berms and other barriers that would essentially line that entire stretch of the creek. It's only now that we're learning the initial scope of what that project will be. And for the county and the core to assume that they can just kind of barrel along with the process and get that implemented um, without sufficient public buy-in to make sure that it actually works for the community, um, actually manages flood issues, actually protects the integrity of homeowners and their properties within that community. I don't know how long it's going to take. Thank you. Ms. Rice? Yeah, I'm as frustrated as, frustrated as anyone around um, 
how long it's taking, taking us all to make progress. But let's remember the timeline. So the flood was in 2005. The flood fee was passed or adopted in 2007. And then the Ross Valley program was held up for almost three years in litigation. So um, in, the, in the last five years, we've made some progress, and albeit it's been way too slow. And now we're on the cusp of actually getting some things done. Those four bridge, re bridge replacements that have to happen. Uh, the Army Corps project, which has been decades languishing, we finally got refunded uh, for the design work just uh, 18 months ago, and it does have a short time frame now. The, the Army Corps wants you to get, get your design work done with it a three-year period, so that's what we're working on. So, um, huge frustration in how much time things are taking, but it, there's a lot of variables at play, and we really, if this is important to the community, if flood prevention is important to this community, we really need to have community members participating in the process, and there's lots of community process, and there will be lots of community process around the Army Corps project, around anything we might do with regards to any future detention basins, but this community needs to decide if it's serious about pursuing flood control and reducing flood risk in our uh, Ross Valley. Thank you. Mr. Egger. The timeline to get something done was five years ago. We've had the money. We've been collecting millions of dollars from the taxpayers. We could have cleaned the creeks. We could have removed debris. There's collapsed retaining walls. Fairfax Town Hall, it blocks the creek. It, it, it's flooded twice, 82 and 2005. We could have lifted a couple of structures, enlarged some culverts. We could have dredged Cordomandera Creek below the concrete ditch down to the Bonaire Bridge. I mean, there's all kinds of things that could have been done instead of paying consultants millions and millions. I guess up to $8 million have been spent on plans, on consultants and on plans and, and they're wrong in a lot of their assumptions. So we need someone who could get that project moving again. We need our own towns here, Fairfax, San Anselmo, and Ross, uh, and, and the county needs to, needs to give them some authority to get in there and do some creek cleaning. Thank you. Thank you. So we've had a couple questions from the, at least a couple questions from the audience uh, on the homeless issue. So we'll begin with Ms. Rice. The question is, uh, the last 10 years, Marin has seen the homeless and, and severely mentally ill people uh, increase exponentially, really dramatically, in, in some areas of the county, particularly San Rafael. If elected, what will you do to rectify this crisis? So I was elected, so I've been working on this the last few years. And um, yes, the problem... The problem of homelessness and the drivers for it um, have gotten worse, and we're seeing more people on the streets here in Marin County, specifically in San Rafael, though in Sausalito, Nevada as well. And, and the same is true for throughout the Bay Area, and, and frankly, in lots of places across the nation. And, and while the thing about homelessness is that the, your successes are invisible, there's over 500 people um, that are housed um, with county funding and given support services um, uh, in Marin County. There's another 184 that are in what's called um, uh, supportive housing uh, services, full partnerships of uh, supportive housing services. But we still have a lot of folks on the street. And one of the things that shifted in the last few years is an emphasis um, that was totally focused on prevention and keeping people from falling onto into the streets and helping people who were newly on the streets to recognizing we have to deal with our the chronically homeless that we're not able yet to get into housing and services. So within the last um, actually few months, the Board of Supervisors allocated significant new funding towards really addressing the chronically homeless. How do we get to reach those folks with substance abuse, or mental health issues who we have not been able to get into services before. We're expanding our capacity in the full service partnerships, and we're also um, look, needing to improve the way we're handling uh, folks in psych emergency. Thank you. Mr. Egger? The county of Marin is the agency responsible for homelessness and homelessness programs in Marin County. First thing I would have, I would have voted to implement Laura's Law right off the bat. I have called for a joint meeting be between the city of San Rafael and the county of Marin. The county of Marin needs to join San Rafael. San Rafael is, is, is kind of hung out to dry on the issue. 40% of their police calls are homeless related. 
neighborhoods like, like Crystal Park and, and Bret Hart and uh, Picnic Valley, those folks aren't feeling safe, face safe in their homes. You know, they, they leave for work in the morning and, and there's homeless people in, in their yard and using their yard for a bathroom. That's totally unacceptable. So we need to join forces with Santa Fe and we need to assist them. Th there are a lot of things that can be done and, and, and one of them is the folks that are coming, the, the, the homeless that are coming through here, their transients are coming through, and they have a line as to where to stop and where to get some services. That's why they're coming through here, because uh, you know, they receive the, uh, their cash uh, general assistance funds uh, right in downtown Santa Fe. I think we have to separate how homeless services are delivered and take that burden off the city of Santa Fe. The Ritter Center has done wonderful work over the years, but they've kind of outgrown their space. And I think they've got to get back to their original mission of help poor, unfortunate people in our communities and let the county Thank take you. on a responsibility for homeless services. services. Thank you. Mr. Haroff. I actually went back uh, in preparation for tonight's uh, program and looked at the civil grand jury report on homelessness in Marin, and it was frightening. <laughs> to see the conclusions that were drawn in that context. And I'm, I'm glad that the county is finally taking some initiative and allocating resources to deal with homelessness within this community because they've absolutely failed to do it for years and years and years in the past. The grand jury, first thing that it noted was that although the county has done plans and studies, those are all essentially aspirational in nature. They don't provide concrete solutions to the homelessness problem within all of the communities uh, both uh, incorporated and unincorporated Marin. The county does need to take a leadership role. It is their job. It has historically just shunted off the responsibilities for dealing with the homelessness problem primarily to San Rafael, but to Novato and other municipalities as well, and that has to stop. There are opportunities for the county to explore housing solutions to deal with homelessness, and I also support the adoption of Laura's Law. I don't understand, although that law has now been in the books, uh, as a statewide matter, why the County of Marin has consistently refused to implement that solution to homeless process problems. It's not by any means a complete solution, but is a tool in the toolbox, and it's a shame that the county has not embraced that. Thank you. Next question, we'll start with Mr. Ager. Are you willing to make a formal commitment to local control of key planning decisions? I am about local control. You know, when ABAG and, and the, and the uh, Housing and Community Development Agency from the state came to Fairfax and they said, Fairfax, you need to approve a, a lot of new units up here. You need to redevelop your downtown. Folks in Fairfax were aghast. I helped those folks at Fairfax. We, we wrote a referendum. And the, the Fairfax Town Council, we actually went to the meeting and said, please don't, don't approve this rezoning because the massive development up to 300 new units up in the upper end of the Ross Valley is just unacceptable. We can't, can't deal with the traffic issues now. Um, there was a four to one vote uh, to approve that rezoning. Uh, council member at the time, Larry Bragman, was the only no vote. We ended up running a referendum. And in fact, we gathered 1,000 signatures in 12 days of registered voters in Fairfax and we overturn the redevelopment of downtown Fairfax and some of the high density development. So in fact, I do believe in ballot box zoning. I believe at times the communities have to stand up and say no. They have to go to their residents with petitions and they have to be able to, you know, to gather them whether in the form of a referendum or an initiative. And, and uh, that, that, that's, that's how we're gonna have a, a local control. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haroff. Yes. <laughs> Uh, that's the short answer. The long answer is uh, I have a, a record as a member of the Larkspur City Cl Council in uh, putting local control over planning and development decisions um, as the highest priority that we need to achieve within our communities in Marin County. Um, I understand that we live in a wider Bay Area and I understand that there are regional pressures that, are, that we are facing in our local community to be responsive and we need to do that. But the way in which planning on a regional basis has been undertaken uh, throughout the Bay Area over recent years has been awful. It has not been respectful of the needs and interests 
of our unique Marin County. And it's only getting worse. Uh, a year or so ago, ABAG was the big boogeyman in the room in terms of regional planning. It's actually looking better and better in light of the fact that MTC is now trying to take over ABAG and exert even more regional control and remove our ability to maintain control over our local development processes. I think it's appropriate for the county to explore, and I will do this as supervisor, to explore options that will take us away from the controlling influences of ABAG and MTC and focus on more local regional mechanisms that can accommodate the requirements of state law, sustainable communities requirements that is part of the state law. We have to deal with that. But we can do that within the framework of local agencies, not sub subordinating ourselves to the agencies that we have with ABAG and MTC. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rice. Yep. Marin County has actually been a really strong voice, and, and the cities and towns, um, in regional government and pushed back hard on ABAG um, during the Plan Bay Area process, um, both uh, on what was being seen as a push for development in um, the smaller counties and the smaller cities, Marin County being one of them, and also um, a, 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 a play at a clawback on local control. California state law is all about uh, local authority, local jurisdictions exercising their local authority over land use, over housing, even over traffic. And I believe strongly that we need to continue to support that and, and actually work together to make sure there's no erosion of local control. At the same time, I think we have to, on all those issues, whether it's land use, housing, or even traffic, when we make decisions as the local jurisdiction and or as the county, we look to how that decision may have an impact on neighboring jurisdictions. That's one of the things that happened when Corte Madera made that horrible decision around the Wind Cup property, uh, which is going to generate traffic that has impacts far beyond uh, the bounds of Corte Madera. So local control is really has to be um, um, our guide and something we must support very strongly. And then as we make decisions at the local level, let's be um, cognizant of their impact positive or negative on neighboring jurisdictions, and that's something that I think is important for us to work together on, both as uh, the cities and towns here in, in Marin County, and then with our neighboring counties, Sonoma, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, next question, we'll, we'll lead off with Mr. Haroff. Environmental and anti-cattle activists have filed a federal suit against the National Park Service that could lead to the effective loss of West Marin's cattle farms. Are you familiar with the issues raised by the lawsuit and poli political action related to it, and where do you stand? I think that the National Park's attempt to subvert historical resources that we have with the farms in the Point Reyes area is a travesty. We saw the Park Service go through an exercise with the oyster farms uh, in the same area a year or two ago essentially to take away a, a cultural resource that is very important to the character of this community. Um, the local folks lost that battle. I think it's important for us as a community to support the ranchers in their fight against the efforts of the National Park Service. There are many wonderful things the National Park Service does. Um, they have responsibilities for managing a significant amount of open space and other uh, natural properties and areas within our community. But those farms and ranches in Point Reyes are something that I remember for the last 30 years taking my kids to go and see. It's part of the culture and the heritage of this community. There's absolutely no environmental or ecological reason to take those ranches out of the system, and I'm absolutely opposed to the efforts of the park system, the park service, uh, to, to challenge uh, the livelihoods of those people who maintain such a wonderful resource for our community. Thank you. Ms. Rice? Yes, well, actually the lawsuit that is being brought, on, brought against the Park Service by um, an environmental group and um, the, the environmental group is trying to block the National Park's cooperative engagement with the ranchers on the point to actually do extend leases, have leases that go beyond five years, that go shoot for 20 years. The county joined up 
um, with the Park Service, actually, and other co-defendants on this lawsuit because, along with the Park Service, we recognize how important the ag industry is and those ranches and farms that are out on the point to the broader Marin County agricultural community and industry. If we lose the ranches on, uh, the, on the seashore, we lose what critical, the critical mass that is needed to sustain agriculture, ag agriculture generally. So um, I think it's a, a really huge issue. It's an important issue for Marin County. Uh, it's an important issue for the ranching community. And it's also an important issue to be looked at environmentally. And frankly, groups like Marin Conservation League and even the Environmental Action uh, Committee of uh, West Marin are all siding with the Park Service, with the ranchers on this one, against uh, the entity that's bringing the lawsuit against the parks. Thank you. Mr. Hager? When the park purchases were taking place, some 40 years ago, some 35 years ago, a number of the ranchers opposed the purchase. To complete purchase of all the ranches, the Park Service paid the full market price at the time for the ranches and added a condition that would give that rancher the right to remain on the land and do their ranching, whether it be dairy or cattle, uh, as long as the family remained. So um, the issue should go directly, directly back to the actual purchase agreement. Let's take a look at that purchase agreement. There's a lot of talk about it's right, it's wrong, what's going on, but let's get the original purchase agreements out and take a look and see what the conditions are. I see no reason to have to close down uh, the ranching and the, and the, and the uh, dairy business out in West Virginia. Now if you're talking about the ranchers being allowed to add vineyards and, and wineries, et cetera, uh, that's not what, that wasn't the intent of the original purchase and wasn't the intent of the conditions to allow the ranchers to remain on the land. So, you know, we need to look at, at, the, at the purchase agreements and, and we need to, to act in a responsible way, uh, keep these ranches going. I, th I, think, I, I think, you know, I information is good to have. It makes for, makes for good public policy and so um, it's just unfortunate that the lawsuit had to be filed to get that kind of information. Thank you. Okay, we have received a number of questions from the audience about Laura's Law. And so the question is, and we'll start with Ms. Rice, do you support Laura's Law? And if not, what would you do to help the mentally ill that are suffering from impaired awareness? Now just as a parenthetical comment, Laura's Law is a California state law that allows for court-ordered assisted outpatient treatment. So to qualify for the program, the person must have a serious mental illness plus a recent history of psychiatric hospitalizations, jailing or acts, threats or attempts of serious violent behavior towards the person's self or others. And it may be enacted in any jurisdiction that wishes to enact it. So getting back to, start with Ms. Rice. Yeah, I, I agree that Laura's Law um, could be a really useful tool here in Marin County. I did not support moving forward with Laura's Law earlier this year. And there was two primary reasons, and I talked about them um, in an earlier answer. One is we've got some significant problems right now with emergency psych, with also with capacity in the kind of care, the inpatient care that's you know a step down from a locked facility that folks with severe mental illness need in order to recover. You're not services are great and treatment is great, but if someone isn't housed and in the right and then the right type of housing and supports with support services, they aren't going to be successful. I voted to put off or delay um, enacting Laura's Law in Marin County until we were able to beef up our services at the level of need that's needed by the severely me mentally ill, and that requires an investment of hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it was going to take hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to enact Laura's law just around the administrative end. So it was a really difficult decision for me because I know folks who are out on the street, I know family members who have people who are out on, on the street, and I just ca came to the conclusion it was not the right time, it was too much money that wasn't gonna go towards services, and then we all need to remember that Laura's law, anyone who comes into services under <coughs> Laura's law has to do so voluntarily and you cannot force treatment or medication. Thank you. Mr. Hager. I would have adopted the implementation of Laura's Law years ago. The state closed the state's mental health hospitals 
oh, wow, what was that, 30 years ago, 25 years ago? Today they are trying, they are trying to close the remaining three development centers, including the one in, in, in at, uh, Eldridge, so one development center. Uh, they house about 450 folks up there, uh, folks that, are, that can't take care of themselves. I've had direct family experience with those kinds of issues uh, around Laurel's Law. And, and I can assure you that, uh, uh, you know, if that would have been available to my family, we could have gotten a family member some help. The, I, I, the, the county is spending what, well over $50 million on mental health, mental health issues. And they're worried about spending 100 or 200,000 implementing Laura's Law? I mean, let's, let's get with the program and, and let's get this law on the books. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Heroff. Uh, I think I already articulated my position on Laura's Law. I think it is a useful tool. It should have been implemented by the Board of Supervisors some time ago. They had an opportunity to do it. Now, I understand that there are costs associated with implementing that particular legislation. There are costs with implementing all kinds of legislation. I understand it as well that it's not a complete solution to dealing with the homelessness problem. I've advocated here tonight and I've advocated uh, elsewhere that the county needs to take greater leadership role instead of abdicating its responsibilities on the homelessness issue as it has done for years and years on the pa in the past. There are plenty of resources within this county, an unbelievable amount of resources within this county to apply to issues like homelessness. Laura's Law is not a complete solution, but it is a shame, as I think I said before, that the county did not take the opportunity to implement it as one strategy that can be effective and can be useful in combating homelessness in Marin County. Okay, thank you. So now we have a couple questions related to consolidation of, of local districts. So if you're in favor of local control, how do you justify consolidation of districts, would that take local control away? And if consolidation is justified by cost control, why not start with saving costs now within each district, the county being the first with a lot of fat to cut? I'm just reading the question. Okay, and we'll start with Mr. Egger. So a number of years ago, um, the cities and towns here in the Ross Valley, Fairfax, San Anselmo, Ross, Larkspur, and Corner Madera, we could not afford paramedic services. None of us were able to, to put on a paramedic unit. But I worked with then Fairfax Fire Chief George Hennema, and we went to each of the towns here in the Ross Valley, and we put together a program to run the Ross Valley Paramedic Authority. It would be 24-7 medics centered out of Ross firehouse. Uh, we took it to the voters. The voters said it makes sense to us. That was really one of the first consolidations of services here in the Ross Valley. And it's worked. It's, it, we provide, we provide state-of-the-art paramedic services to the, to the residents of the Ross Valley. Court of Madera has even added a paramedic unit. So uh, that's one in incident where uh, consolidation worked. Some communities have talked about police consolidation and there's the issue of community policing. Some of those are fairly sensitive. So for instance, Fairfax has not consolidated its police services. The residents are happy with, with the level of service they're receiving from the Fairfax Police Department. So you've got to kind of pick and choose. It's obvious that some of the fire departments are, 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 are ready for consolidation, and that's the direction we should be, that's the direction we should be going. Um, as far as special districts, they, they propose a consolidation of sanitary districts down in Southern Marin, it actually went on a ballot and it was turned down by the voters. So it's not really clear Thank cut you. that folks accept uh, consolidation. Thank you. Mr. Heroff? I think it's important to make a distinction when we talk about local control. When I think about, uh, in this context, when I think about local control, I think primarily about local control over planning and development decisions because it's those kinds of decisions where local determinations can most influence the character of our community and preserve what's important to us in our communities about living in Marin. So that's where I really focus on local control. I think there are opportunities, I know there are opportunities to consolidate services in appropriate and reasonable ways. We've done it in the city of Larkspur years ago. The city of Larkspur combined forces with the, the town of Court Madeira to form the Twin Cities Police Department. 
Um, more recently, we took that and combined with the police department in San Anselmo, and now we have the Central Marin uh, Police Authority. I think by every objective assessment, uh, that consolidation has been successful. Uh, in Larkspur, we're also looking now at opportunities to consolidate aspects of our fire uh, services within uh, Corp Madera and Larkspur, and I'm hoping we'll make good progress on that. We've engaged in joint services agreements with San Rafael to take advantage of opportunities that exist within all of our communities to make sure we're actually providing these services in a way that responds to the needs and interests of our community members and not just to maintain local control for the sake of it. When it comes to planning and development, that's one thing. I'm all in favor of that. When it comes to serving the public health and safety needs of our community, we need to look at opportunities to do that better. Thank you. And Ms. Rice. Yeah, I would agree. I think it's uh, just smart government, good government, to be looking for opportunities to improve service delivery, to make service delivery more cost effective, more cost efficient, um, as long as as long as the public is being served. And I also um, uh, I don't think consolida a consolidation that happens happens with the local the local parties making the decision to consolidate. And we've heard of some of the examples where there have been decisions that were made at the local level to consolidate, whether it's fire service or police, or the paramedic authority that was uh, formed, and then also where a local, where the local districts have chosen not to, um, and the community has made that decision. There's other really um, excellent examples in the very recent, in recent history, recent years, um, dispatch, uh, police and fire dispatch, there's been some consolidation um, on that across the, with the county and some of the cities. There's also opportunities, I do think, within the sanitary districts that we need to look at. I sit on the San Rafael Sanitary District Board that's served by the treatment facility CMSA along with the Ross Valley Sanitary District. Um, not sure if Ross Valley Sanitary District is interested in consolidating, but certainly I think uh, San Rafael San is interested in looking at can we consolidate with CMSA. We don't need to have as much government, as many small districts as we do in this community. Uh, we've got what, uh, I want to say 19 school districts and I don't know how many other um, sanitary districts. But make decisions about consolidation that make sense for the community, are supported by the community, and then move forward. Thank you. The next question involves what one person put as the elephant in the room. We've had a number of questions about this from the audience, including a question from the chamber. It's pensions. If elected or re-elected, will you seriously address the issue of pensions eating out everything else in the budget? Are you ready to take the pledge asked by citizens for sustainable pension plans? And we'll begin with Mr. Herhoff. Well, that's an easy one for me, because the answer again is yes. I like short answers, actually. I was very um, grateful last summer to receive the endorsement of Citizens for Sustainable Pension Plans. That's a trip on the tongue. Um, because we met with them. I met with them. And we talked about the challenges that we face within Marin County, and more generally, the challenges that governments face throughout the state of California and the nation at large. We have a pension system that is largely out of control. It's a system that was developed in order to protect and respect the needs and interests of our public employees, and we need to continue to do that. But there are different ways to do that, and the county, in fact, has been falling down on the job in doing what it needs to do to ensure that public employees are both protected and the taxpayers are protected as well. Again, I go back to the civil grand jury and the report that was undertaken um, by that body and criticizing the county for it re repeated and prolonged efforts to essentially expand the pension program within uh, Marin County without sufficient public engagement and sufficient respect for the taxpayers within this community. There are ways that we can move towards a more responsible pension program within Marin County. We're taking opportunities now within the county as well as in the city of Larkspur to deal with our other uh, post-employment benefit plans, our OPEB liabilities. We can make progress on that. There are resources to do that without compromising the interests of the taxpayer. Thank you. Ms. Rice. Yeah, um, I don't believe in pledges, so I wouldn't take that pledge. And I also, um, I also uh, think that the county actually has set a fairly good example of of managing pension debt and actually managing contracts which, with its labor. 
and um, was ahead of the game uh, compared to some of the cities and towns in Marin County, including eliminate, eliminating pension spiking years before PEPRA, including negotiating contracts with our labor groups that eliminate the employer contribution to their retirement, including um, stepping forward with uh, paying ahead on our retiree health liability way in advance uh, of other entities. And uh, as a result, um, our unfunded pension liability right now, we're 84% we're funded, which is, is pretty good, and I suggest higher than the cities and towns. Um, every, many communities, and I think every community in Marin County made a big mistake, and, and others throughout the state of California back in around 2000, when they made, they enhanced pension benefits retroactively. Um, that was allowed by law, um, it was done for reasons to stay competitive, it was before my time, and that's really what has cracked the back of government in California. But I would say that um, for all the work that the county's done and kept us ourselves in fairly good fiscal shape, we need to do more, but we need to have the authority through the state legislator, le legislature in order to do it. And I really do think we need to be looking at hybrid pension plans. Thank you. Mr. Egger. There's two issues. There's the pensions, the cost of the pensions, and there's the post-employment health benefits. The post-employment health benefits, 482 cities, 58 counties, 2,000 special districts, hundreds of school districts, state employees, and teachers. The estimate is close to $400 billion in unfunded liability. So little Warren County is not going to accomplish much on its own. The solution to that is a single-payer universal health care plan. That's the only way we're going to solve the post-employment health care benefit issue as far as pensions. There are two main systems. There's the 1937 Act, of which the county is, MSERA, Marin County uh, Retirement uh, Group, and then there's PERS, P-E-R-S, that's a state employee retirement group. Most of the cities belong to PERS. What we see happening is a person retires from one agency, PERS, then it goes to work for the county. Uh, they collect a six-figure retirement from their PERS agency they retired from after working 30 years, say, and then they go to, a, uh, to the county and, 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 and work under the, a different retirement plan. They can do that. And then they work there 10 years or whatever, and they're going to collect another retirement. First of all, I, I create a county policy that the only people we're going to hire at the county level is someone who needs a job. Either, either employ from, from, from below, uh, have, have, have a move up for existing employees, or in I'm fact, sorry. not hire someone who's retired from another agency. Thank you. Okay, next question. And we'll start with Ms. Rice. <coughs> Should glyphosate-based herbicides or pesticides be banned in open space in parklands? That's the first part of the question. And the second part is, have you ever had another position other than your current position, and why? Um, the last question first, I think that they must mean an elected position, and I have not had, I'm, I'm guessing, I have not had an elected position prior to being uh, county supervisor and elected in 2012, um, but I have served as the founder uh, of the Ross Valley Schools Foundation. I've served on many boards. Um, so yes, this is my only elected uh, office to date. Uh, on glyphosate, so the county has done a remarkable job and, in fr and frankly is a leader in integrated pest management and in the reduction of use of all herbicides and pesticides or synthetic based herbicides and pesticides. In fact, uh, the county of Marin, um, we, well, as I said in my opening remarks, we've declared our parks, our regional parks, our public buildings, our public rec fields, our medians are all now uh, glyphosate free. But we held in our pocket for open space for very critical uses, the use of glyphosate and other herbicides. And there's three reasons. One, we have some really special species, uh, native species out there, one of them being the Tiburon mariposa lily that exists only in Tiburon. It is being crowded out by something called harding grass that even through a very aggressive IPM program that um, involves digging out and mulching and all the other things, 
Um, we haven't been able to keep the harding grass from encroaching on the Tiburon Mariposa lily. The only thing that works is an IPM program that includes the judicious use of herbicides. That's the kind of, that's the reason why you Thank need you. to sometimes keep an herbicide in the back pocket for critical uses around really critical, important uh, issues. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Egger. Yes, we should ban all pesticides from the county commons, unincorporated Marin. It's interesting. The county won't pass an ordinance. We passed an ordinance in Fairfax. I, I authored the ordinance, and, and the ordinance says there should be no pesticides of any kind used on the commons, streets, parks, ball fields, the creeks, uh, sidewalk areas, the public rights of way. We did that in 2001 in Fairfax, and it works. We don't use pesticides in Fairfax. We passed a law. The only way to make it enforceable is passing an ordinance. Now, now if Marin County had an ordinance, it would have prevented the recently sprayed half mile of pesticides uh, on, the, on the road uh, from uh, Point Reyes to Petaluma, just past McAvoy Ranch, the Olive Ranch up there. There's about a half mile of roadside that's been sprayed with probably glyphosate around some type of Roundup. If they had an ordinance, that, or an ordinance on the books, that would have been prevented. They could not have sprayed. There's no reason to have to spray pesticides on public property at all. The health of our kids, the health of our pets, I mean, our own health is, is paramount here. This is a county with huge, huge breast cancer issues. You know, my little street, Manaway and Fairfax, 29 homes and 15 breast cancers in 29 homes. There's something going on. So. I'd say no pesticides, none, zero, zero. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haroff. Again, I want to get back to your specific question and your specific question focused on glyphosate and our respective positions regarding the use of glyphosate-based herbicides um, now and whether that position has changed over time. And I'm glad to have the opportunity to explain my position because it's maybe a little bit more nuanced than my opponent's. When I first announced my uh, candidacy last summer, one of the first things that I stated as part of that announcement was my unequivocal opposition to the use of glyphosate-based herbicides on county properties, period. And the reason for that was that earlier in the year, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, um, a branch of World Health Organization, listed glyphosate as a probable human carcinogen. That listing is now in the course of resulting in a determination by the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment in Sacramento of glyphosate and glyphosate-based products as chemicals known to the state of California to cause cancer. Um, it is my principled view that it is inappropriate and wrong for the county to be applying a chemical that has been listed as a known carcinogen anywhere where it can result in exposures to children, pets, adults, anyone. It's just wrong as a matter of policy. Uh, so my opposition to the use of glyphosate is focused, it's limited, it's based upon a determined specific scientific determination that that chemical is a probable human carcinogen and a regulatory determination that it will be listed as a chemical known to the state of California to cause cancer. Thank you. Okay, next question. We'll begin with Mr. Egger. What is your position on night lights at Marin Catholic High School? So there's two issues down there in, in that part of the valley. The night lights at Marin Catholic High School and the helipad at Marin General Hospital. The residents of the Green Bay area are really concerned about what's going to happen. You know, what I know is what I've read in the paper. Um, they, Marin Catholic uh, is a sports-minded uh, high school, and uh, evidently they're, they're proposing over 500 uh, such uses at nighttime. There's only 365 days a year. I'm not sure how they arrived at that kind of number. You know, if they'd have been talking about maybe six night, night varsity games and, and earlier a, a JV game, uh, that, might be, that might be reasonable for, for a community. But uh, what's being proposed seems to be way out of line. And, and I'm hoping that uh, that Ridge Catholic and the county are gonna are gonna get together and work out some kind of a uh, an arrangement where where we all know exactly what's proposed and, and how many games are going to take place and the impact on, on our communities. You know, 
Nevada was also trying to get lights on a high school up there, so it, it's it's not a it's not just a, just a, a Ross Valley issue. It, it's a countywide issue, and, and the schools are looking, you know, to expand expand their opportunities for for the young ball players. So, for or against lights, I don't I don't have a position on it, but I'm I'm concerned that what they want is way too much. Thank you, Mr. Heroff. Sure. Um, first of all, with respect to the reference to the heliport at Marin General, I have to say that there are, to my knowledge, no plans to put in a heliport at Marin General as part of the build out that they're doing right now. And I say that based upon a presentation by the president of the hospital at the Larkspur City Council meeting just a couple of weeks ago, where that question specifically was asked. And he said, no, because we would never get our expansion project developed if we had a heliport as part of it. So there are no plans for a heliport. In terms of the lights, I actually attended a meeting about a year or so ago, sponsored by Marin Catholic, where they were talking about the proposal to put lights in to support night, night games. And my reaction to that proposal at the time is the same as my reaction to it today. Well, that's interesting, but you know you're gonna have to go through an extensive environmental impact analysis to evaluate the environmental impacts associated with that proposal. And I'm skeptical that after you go through that environmental impact analysis under the California Environmental Quality Act, that you'll actually be able to develop mitigations from the environmental impacts, from the traffic impacts, from the whole range of impacts that this fundamental change in use associated with night games at that stadium will ever be allowed within this community. So technically, I'm agnostic. If they can do the environmental review in a way that will mitigate the environmental impacts to the satisfaction of our community, then I, hard for me to say no. I think it's a bad idea, but I think it's really a community determination based upon a considered assessment of environmental impacts in full compliance with the requirements of the California Environmental Quality Act. Thank you. Ms. Rice? I am also not um, supportive of the proposal that was put on the table um, a few months ago and, and then actually has gone back to the drawing boards more in Catholic. What was proposed was, you know, an extensive increase in the amount of use uh, of that field with the advent of, of lights. Um, and um, I agree with my colleagues, that, um, especially Frank, that what was put on the table was too much. And, and it's really important, though, while we recognize that field space is so important, that we don't have enough field space for all the, for not just youth, but, but frankly, uh, adult athletic programs, um, there are impacts when you extend the, um, when you extend activities into the night. And I've spoken with lots of the community members who live near and, and above Marine Catholic, and you know, the lights are one issue, but it's really the sound that is a change, um, the amount of noise that emanates from below during the night, that's gonna be a significant change for that community. So um, I agree with, with Kevin. Um, any project, once they get their application complete, if they decide to move forward, is gonna have to be an, uh, analyzed through the California Environmental Quality Act, and they're gonna be looking at light impacts and sound noise impacts and traffic impacts and environmental impacts. And then along with that process, if the mitigations can be put in place to mitigate whatever um, impacts there might be or along those things, there also needs to be um, more community process and I think some give and take. I'm not ruling out lights at Marin Catholic, but I think they significantly need to tone down the project proposal. Okay, thank you. So we have one last question and it involves marijuana. The November ballot will have a ballot measure to legalize marijuana. What should the towns and cities do about legalized marijuana? Should we open stores? If so, where? What parameters could or should be implemented? We'll start with Mr. Hayoff. Thank you. I, again, I kind of have to separate my own personal views about this issue from um, what um, uh, the interests of our community might be because I don't think we've had a full enough dialogue within the community about the merits of that particular proposal. My own personal view is that I don't want to see marijuana shops in Larksburg. I think they're a bad idea. Um, and I can explain why I have those personal views. But I don't want to put my own personal views about that issue above what the community wants to have happen. I think it's important for us to have a robust dialogue. We will have those dialogues within, I'm sure, the Larksburg City Council um, as we get closer to consideration about what that will mean within our community. Um, th these are issues that are very unique to the different communities that we have in Marin. I know that 
some of our communities will be more respective or more receptive to that proposal than others will be. So we have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis. We have to look at what our neighborhoods want, um, what our neighbors want, what our local businesses want in terms of the implications for having those kinds of businesses within their community. And I think once we have that dialogue, we'll uh, come up with a responsible solution. Okay, Ms. Rice. Yeah, personally, I'm, I'm not really a fan of um, legalizing recreational marijuana, but I also recognize that um, it is a question that can be brought to the voters and that decision can be made. And if recreational marijuana does move forward, then I think it's going to be really important that um, parameters be put around um, how, how, how operators are set up or where they can be licensed. The county's just gone through a medicinal marijuana um, ordinance um, creation and it's put some really strict parameters around n the number of medicinal marijuana um, outlets that can be put in place and in the undercorporate in uh, location to, you know, proximity to schools, proximity to children in parks, uh, a lot of parameters around how the businesses are operated with regards to security, with regards to um, use on site, which there shouldn't be. So I think that it is, um, it's, it is, it is a, it is an issue and a permitting um, kind of op, um, uh, process that does have to be taken up at the community level. Um, and I do think each community is probably going to approach it a little bit differently. Thank you. Mr. Egger. Fairfax was the site of the first legal medical marijuana dispensary in, in the Bay Area. Um, it's been over 20 years since that uh, they applied for a permit in Fairfax. Uh, the Fairfax Police Department put a huge number of conditions on it, and they met all the conditions. The dispensary actually functioned well for a number of years until the feds came in and basically shut it down. So what's going to happen now? That measure on the ballot is going to pass, and we in the city need to be able to deal with it. It needs to be taxed. It needs to be controlled. We have to have tough restrictions on driving of the influence of, of marijuana. We need tough restrictions on workplace use. And we need restrictions similar to, to what kind of restrictions we have on smoking in our communities now. You know, secondhand smoke, whether it be from a camel or, or from a joint, it's not good for, for folks. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be able to manage it because it's going to pass and we need to get ready for it. Um, Fairfax has had the experience and I think they're, they're prepared to deal with it. So uh, I, su I support the legalization of it. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it was, it was what, banned in, what, 1930 or 31 when they when 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 uh, outlawed the use of it. Well, it's coming back, you know, uh, 90 years later and it's going to be legal. So, so we, we have to deal with it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that ends the question portion of our program and we'll begin with two-minute summations in reverse alphabetical order, starting with Ms. Rice. Well, um, thank you all for taking the time to be here tonight and for taking the time, I'm sure that you do, outside of tonight to participate in local issues and county issues. It really does. Uh, democracy is best when we've got uh, people of different viewpoints coming into the room, expressing their opinion, and also um, government and, and public process that's really inclusive. So I, I bring to this um, job, um, I think, a track record of success, even with in the short term I've been in the, uh, this office. Um, everything from open space uh, protection to public health, um, uh, critical, um, important policy. I also bring to this job um, success bringing folks together, electives, community leaders, and working together to come up with real solutions to real problems and issues. As a supervisor, I've been an active member of the community. As a resident of San Anselmo, I've been an actor, active member of the community. I've earned the respect and trust of leaders throughout the district and the county, and that trust and respect is reflected in a really broad and deep endorsement list that crosses institutions, it crosses issues, and it crosses communities. 
I consider the most important quality any leader can have to be the ability to bring different viewpoints into the same room, stakeholders to the table, and to work together to forge solutions for the community and for the common good. I believe in collaboration, not litigation, as the way to resolving problems. I truly believe in the power of working together. I love this job. I love working with and for this community on the myriad issues we face, small and large. It's truly a privilege to serve as supervisor, and it would be an honor to have your vote uh, come June 7th or when you put your mail ballot into the mailbox. Thanks so much for having me here tonight. Thank you. Mr. Harrell. I just want to start again by thanking all of you for being here tonight. Uh, thank the Chamber of Commerce for hosting this event, uh, and to, uh, to thank the, uh, the candidates who are here at the di up the dais uh, this evening. I, it, was a, it was fun and enlightening for, I think, all of us. I want to just close by pointing out one thing that I think is important for all of you to know about me, which is something that I think differentiates me from the other candidates up here at, at the table. Um, unlike these folks, I haven't spent my entire adult life being part of the Marin political establishment. Um, I've worked for the last 38 years dedicating my entire professional career to the practice of environmental law, the private practice of environmental law. Sometimes for individuals and neighborhood groups, sometimes for small businesses and government agencies, and sometimes even for the nation's largest companies. I have never been involved in a matter where I have not been proud of my involvement. In the course of the experience that I've had during those 30 years practicing law, I've acquired the ability to see both sides of what are often complex and challenging issues. I've had the opportunity to work with adversaries to resolve what are often highly contentious disputes. And where agreement is not possible, I've had the opportunity to argue aggressively and successfully for principles that I believe in, occasionally in some of the highest courts in the nation. For those reasons, I believe I have a unique set of skills and abilities that will allow me to provide the kind of leadership we need in this county, to protect the environmental values that make the county so unique, and to genuinely enhance the welfare and interests of all of us who call Marin our home. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attention this evening. Get out and vote, um, and uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Mr. Egger. So, I'm 77 years old. People ask me, hey Frank, where do you get all that energy? What motivates and drives me is my sense of values and strong sense of curiosity. I'm interested and I pay close attention. I ask what's right and what's not. I observe and I participate. I value everyday people I value justice, and I'm passionate about the environment. I served seven terms as mayor of Fairfax and currently represent you on the Ross Valley Sanitary District Board. I represented Marin on the California Coastal Commission for many years of dedicated stewardship. The Sierra Club rated me as a top environmental vote of all 84 commissioners. That was after nine years, and at the time, they turn around and they endorse me again today. So Sierra Club's been with me. My experience has taught me that the best decisions can only be accomplished through openness in government and public participation in local decision making. I'd like to conclude with a few words others have used to describe and endorse me. MMWD Director Larry Bragman says, Frank is a gold standard for diligence. The California Nurses Association says, Frank has played an important role in the advancement of public health care services for decades. His long-term support for single-payer universal health care is unwavering and, and significant to us. Marin residents will be well served if he's elected. Cynthia Jackson of the Marin Organization to Reduce Homelessness says, Frank Ager is the perfect example of the kind of leader we need for District 2. He supports his constituents and addresses issues head-on with results. He supports Laura's law. In closing, you know, the wisdom of years has taught me a lot about how government works, and I look forward to the opportunity to apply that knowledge as your supervisor. Yet I remain open and accessible. I will listen to your concerns in Thank order you. to better understand your needs. I speak from the heart, Thanks. and I take you seriously. Thank you. Thank you. So that's it. You guys have... Been 
covered an incredible amount of ground here tonight in an hour and a half. And I thank, uh, thank each of the candidates, and I especially thank the Chamber for putting this on. And um, read the IJ, stay informed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, couldn't help but put in a little plug there. And uh, vote. More to this too. Thank you to Mr. Sterling for coming in, the IJ for supporting the chamber and our three candidates tonight. Great job, folks, and all of you for asking questions. I'll throw in one thought here. I bet most of you will end up voting on June 7th. I would make some money if I bet on most of the room voting. But I'm going to ask all of you to go out and try to convince, ask, get somebody who's 18 to 24 out there to vote for the first time. So there's your deep thought for the night. Have a safe drive home. Thank you for coming. Take care.